Um, so we lost the lecture because I wasn't able to be here on Thursday, but that's okay because I am mostly fitting what I really want to get to in this single lecture. And then uh, we'll pick up uh, some loose ends in, in a couple lectures, maybe the last lecture, but just for a few times in the middle of so that um, And today the room is, is a little towards the front, so I apologize if I'm <laughs> standing on the desk to do this, but uh, it works out so much. Um, so, uh, so we had a bunch of learning objections, objections, uh, objections, learning objections. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says about my class. But <laughs> Anywho, uh, so uh, objectives, right? And so let's just run through these at least sort of at, at a high level sense. But what was the what was the business with the small tip angle approximation? Why was why did why did we even need to take advantage of or even think about these small tip? We set up the equation of motion, and we were interested in slice selection in particular, right? So if we're doing slice selection, we need to turn on two things, right? This person has a question about this gradient, and several others. Gradient plus RF, right? So those two things together let us do slice selection. And if you look at the equation of motion, when you have both the gradient and the RF field turned on, you get a pretty complicated coupled system of differential equations. And maybe a classmate's in the system who's going to try to solve that for us. So hopefully that pans out. Um, but the bottom line was, because that system of equations was, was coupled and, and pretty complicated, we, we knew we could get a numeric solution to it, and sort of simulation methods would get us there. But if we take a simple uh, approximation, it, uh, which is kind of a funny one, right? We made an assumption about what happens to mz. Do you know what it was? We said mz was constant, right? So it's like, what is that? Right? I'm trying to tip the magnetization over, but I'm insisting that mz be and if your flip angle is small, that seems like a reasonable thing. What was surprising and part about that whole result was that the small tip angle approximation actually works pretty well even up to 90 degree flip angles, right? And that's because, in part, the, the block equation is like nonlinear MZ. Um, that's not a you know, completely solid answer, but that's part of what we were trying to suggest. Um, and so then we would at least hopefully appreciate in part that the small tip angle approximation works even for intermediate. Um, what was the result actually of the small tip angle approximation? What did it say about the envelope function for an RF pulse? We, we made a connection between the envelope function and what we call the slice profile. Right? What, was the, what was the mathematical relationship between those two? Fourier transforms, right? So you, you might have this question in your head, ah, how do I design my envelope function in the first place? And the answer to having worked through the small tip angle approximation is, no worries, all we have to do is take the Fourier transform of that D1 envelope function, and that'll tell me about the slice profile. And the slice profile is what I want when I've designed a good envelope function. Now, there's a whole, there's another whole course you can teach, uh, some universities do, on our pulse design. So you can get much more involved in that. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we have envelope functions, but they're always of finite duration, right? We don't have long, infinitely long RF pulses. Our RF pulses are typically how long? Your answer? Okay, so 125 microseconds. What, what's another? What else do you guys think? How long is an RF pulse? Is it a minute, second, millisecond, microsecond? Millisecond, right? Yeah, so 100, millisecond, 100 microseconds, a few hundred microseconds. It could be many milliseconds, that's fine too. Um, but as a consequence of having finite duration RF pulses, we end up with these so called truncation artifacts. And that had two, that had two um, implications. It meant that inside of our slice, our excitation might be a little uneven, right? So we would want to excite a perfect uh, box function that would be perfect slice selective excitation, but it would have some wiggles in it. Uh, and that's a consequence of, of having a finite duration RF pulse. The other consequence was this was the slice that we wanted to excite, but we were also exciting some stuff outside of our slice, which is another truncation effect. So there's some imperfections when we play finite duration RF pulses, but to work with them, deal with them, and, and maybe make them go away a little bit. Um, you should, at this point, especially after the last two lectures, be able to sort of describe case space in words, and then uh, there are a couple key relationships you should be able to write down about case space as well. The most important one being that where we are in case space depends on the gradient of this wave, right? K of t is, is related to the integral degree of wave from that center. So keep that in mind, because uh, we'll come back and look at some examples of that. Maybe it's the next lecture, uh, but that's uh, 
I like asking questions about that connection and applying it. So we're not as case-based with like doing it space as like maybe this one could be space. So you should familiarize yourself uh, with that sort of abstraction. And we'll work through it as well there. But uh, uh, great to have some kind of common connection. Um, and then, and then hopefully we come to an understanding of the connection between FOIA encoding and image acquisition. So we talked about frequency encoding, we talked about phase encoding, and how those allow us to move around and collect the different K ports that we need to pull up on the K matrix. Uh, and uh, we talked conceptually about what it is that we're doing when we measure uh, K port and where we've been aligning that with frequencies. Um, and then the last thing is, and, and there's different ways to sort of think about this, but the last thing was you should be able to describe the role of phase and and this is relatively simple. The simplest answer I would give for this is that we need to encode two spatial dimensions, uh, or we have to encode two data dimensions because we have two spatial dimensions that we need to measure, right? And phase and frequency encoding are one way of allowing us to span K space, and then subsequent to that, of course, the 2D FOIA comes to allow us to span other space. So kind of high-level overview of where we, where we were at the end of our class, for sure. Um, a few class business things. Uh, Write this down because you'll want this for Thursday. So Thursday we have our first lab. And I assigned, uh, you guys nominated some groups and then I sort of put people into groups uh, subsequent to that. So uh, you should see yourself with the group that you nominated and if not, I just made groups. Um, hopefully there's no repeats there with names. Uh, if you see a problem or have a conflict, let me know. Uh, the, the lab normally runs on Thursday from six to nine, but we break them into two sessions. So there's a six o'clock session and a seven o'clock. Our, we'll be using our clinical scanners, and the clinical um, workflow ends pretty much right at 6. So there's a small chance this group will get started a little bit late, 6.15 or something like that, and we'll try to get you wrapped up still by close to 7 or 8. Uh, but just uh, you know, be a little bit of a warning on that in case you're confused. Um, I'll tell you what these things mean when you're actually in the lab, but these are just different scanners. We have a 1.5T, a 3T, and a 5T system. Those are the three systems that we use. Um, so, are there con does anyone notice a conflict or a problem with what's written here? I can't make it. Um, I'm using both of the last two groups. Uh, you're here. And then there's one. Oh, and you're there. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. This is a question of like, how quickly, right? Uh, okay, so that will sort out uh, if there's not a, the main thing I'm looking for is a time conflict. Right? There's just no way you can make one up that you want to. And then out of Lightness when we do the second lab, we'll switch early and late, and it's just uh, makes life a little bit easier. If that creates a conflict, then let me know. Uh, but it sounds like we're okay. Uh, this is no big conflict. If something shows up, tell me, let me know. Uh, the thing that you'll have to do beforehand, we'll give you the lab assignment. We should post that probably today, possibly tomorrow. You don't have to do a lot in advance in the lab. You mostly have to show up. The one thing that you definitely need to do, though, is complete uh, the screening form. So the screening form is just giving me some comfort and confidence that we don't have a conflict or a problem with the thing that you or the Amara scanner room, if I can show you the magnets and kind of play with the magnets a little bit. Uh, so it's gonna be a screening form about sort of whether you have previous his, you know, surgeries, implanted devices, you're a pacemaker, these kinds of things. Sometimes those are very private sort of confidential things and you might not wanna to talk to me about it, fully okay. Uh, if you can indicate though that you have some questions or concerns, then I'll connect you with one of our staff, uh, either one of our MR techs or one of our so don't feel like you have to disclose anything specifically to me. My job is I have to keep you safe and keep the people in the lab as safe as possible. Um, the second thing related to that, the screen form itself will ask for some personal information. I don't need it, right? I don't, I don't need your phone number, I don't need your address, uh, I don't need to know when you last had a pregnancy test, like these kinds of things, right? My concern is safety, right? Do you have you know, something that would cause you concern based on the screen form about going in and near the I'm not gonna push you to get in the scanner, uh, but we're still gonna be in what we call zone four, which is like the scanner room itself. Uh, so is that clear? I need you to fill it out, I need you to sign it, I'm gonna sign them too, uh, but don't disclose anything that you're not comfortable with, and if you have a question about something that you're not comfortable with, then I'll feel free to come talk to me about it. Okay? Uh, so do that, and that'll be posted online. Uh, so just wrapping up a little bit of uh, business, I, I gave you this number uh, previously, maybe last week, so. Uh, 13 plus or minus three points. This is the range, just so people kind of know where things stand. The actual max point total was 15, I think, but there was one bonus point. Uh, homework two I have today, we can hand them back, average this down a little bit, nothing that I'm uh, worried or concerned about, and this is again the range. So there are definitely people kind of maxing out scores here. 
which for me just means it's difficult to sort of easily curve the class, right? Uh, although I do take into consideration sort of how people progress through the class. Uh, so in average right now, people have about 25 plus or minus 5 points in a given one. So it plays a reasonable range there. Um, if you are less than, and this is somewhat arbitrary, so if you're worried about your grade or if you're less than, if you're definitely less than 20 points, reach out to me. Send an email, give me a phone call, just wait for the class, just call the class, something. Because I want to touch base with you and figure out what your trajectory is sort of getting through the last few weeks of the class, right? Because we're in week is this six, or seven, or we're just in the weeks, right? Quarter system. Uh, so you definitely want to touch base with me, uh, and I can make some clarifications. What I will say is the labs, we don't tend to grade really hard. Uh, we still have to work on it hard, uh, but, uh, but the labs are, uh, it's mostly kind of an experience. Once you learn something, you get to learn once you kind of sort of um, experience using the machines themselves. But they're not graded in a great deal. Anymore. Nor are they especially long in the class. Uh, so that part of the class should be kind of concerning too much. And you're in the middle of homework three, so there's going to be a bunch of points coming in. So at any rate, um, definitely connect with me because uh, I want to I want to make sure that you know things are going to be okay. Yes. Uh, so if you haven't been to our MR uh, suite before, right now we're over in CHS, right? So C uh, no, where are we? We're in engineering, right? So engineering is up here, right? Uh, Didieris is right here. So you know where Didieris is? In and outs over here, right? And probably <laughs> someone over here, and over here, right? Uh, and so that gives you two points, then you know right through the line. Um, so, so here, so you were office here. This is where my office is. So a lot of you have been to office hours, uh, which has been great. I think you guys, not everyone, uh, but there are a bunch of people coming to office hours. And I think it's definitely benefiting the people that, that are coming to office hours. Um, uh, bottom line, where do you need to meet me? Meet, meet me outside here. I know some of you know exactly where to go, and you can just go straight to the scanners. But, but please don't do that. The main reason for that is it's a clinical environment. And we have old ladies getting their MR exams and old men getting their MRI exams. And I just want to make sure we have a, a perfectly comfortable situation for everybody, uh, for, for the patients in particular, and then for you guys as well. So, so bottom line, even if you know exactly where to go uh, to stay in my good graces, just meet on the outside here. Uh, it'll be dark, unfortunately, and it's just kind of the way it goes. Hopefully it's not raining. If it's raining, then uh, we'll sort of figure out how to get away from the first couple of patients. Uh, but bottom line, meet me outside here. Does everyone kind of know where that is? Almost uh, learning objectives here. These we'll come back to sort of the uh, beginning of the next lecture, but some, some things to be thinking about as we, as, our, as we work on our PhD selection. And today's lecture is mostly about image reconstruction. And there's a handful of sort of uh, discrete topics to talk about, and we'll sort of collect some important things towards the end. Uh, and we'll kind of go from there. So uh, before I do get going, uh, sorry, this is jumping so much today. Before I do get going, uh, are there questions about sort of the lab or the homework, so sort of where we are in the course, that kind of stuff? Um, so one thing that we uh, haven't spent any time talking about yet in any detail uh, is the idea that we can receive MR signals from multiple uh, channels, right? So we have different coils, right? We have a head coil, we have a shoulder coil, we have an abdominal coil, knee coil, ankle coil, lots of coils. And any one of those individual coils is, is generally comprised of multiple what we call channels. Um, sometimes people call it multiple coil reconstruction. Sometimes every sometimes the individual coils are called channels. So a little bit more specific is to refer to the, the name of the channels. And so I showed you this picture before when we were talking about the, the B field that the receiver generates as a consequence of this reciprocity. And we can talk about the sensitivity, how good of a coil we have uh, um, plays a role in how well we pick signal. And we can color the magnitude of that signal uh, according to the coil. So this is coil one. Coil one is this top coil here. And this particular coil in this example picks up, this is the top of the chest or anterior chest and the head is sort of up here, right? So I'm getting pretty good signal towards this corner of my field of view. And things that are farther and farther away from my coil, I get less and less signal. Good surprise. So if I have a relatively small coil here, which is this element here, this is the kind of shading that I get. The electronic design of, say, this channel and this channel is, are going to be identical, right? They're going to have the same hardware components built in. But because it's positioned in a different location, this coil is more inferior. It's, it's a little further down. Uh, I'm going to pick up tissues that are especially close to the coil, and I'm not going to pick up tissues that are further and further away from the coil. 
So all you're seeing here is what we call coil shading. Every coil has a, an intensity profile associated with it, usually called the sensitivity profile. It's actually a really useful thing. Uh, this is sort of thinking ahead to one of the lectures we'll come uh, in the last two weeks of class. But there's actually some spatial encoding happening here at these coils already, right? Meaning that this might be very low resolution, but this coil here is, is generally sensitive to this top corner. This coil here is sensitive to this bottom left corner. Uh, and this coil is, say, bottom right, and this coil is top right. So the coils themselves are actually giving you some spatial information. And there are some interesting ways you can use that spatial information uh, uh, in a process called parallel imaging. And we'll hear about parallel imaging, which is a way to scan even faster and are pretty slow. Uh, but we'll pick up on that uh, in a couple of lectures here about what these kinds of coils might be. So the point is that each of your individual coils or individual channels gives you a slightly different picture for the field of view that you've targeted uh, and all I want to talk about really quickly is how do we combine that information together to make a single useful image. And the, the principle is relatively straightforward. This is all of our case-based data that we would have, say, for the jade coil, where we have eight coils, 16 coils, 22 coils, or something like this. Um, we could go immediately to image space if we want to from the case-based data. And we're just taking, uh, in this case, to look at a magnitude image. We generally, in uh, MR imaging, we generally concern ourselves with magnitude images. And so it's really just a root mean square combination. You can square uh, at the pixel level, individual pixels. You can square them and then divide by some noise variance that I'll talk about in just a second. Add up the signal from all of the coils and then you can square these up and get uh, like uh, units of people or, or, or magnitude. And so uh, the thing that we really care about is how do we get the final image magnitude, which is what we generally look at. We take the image from each of the individual coils and you'll see that we're normalizing by what we call the noise variance. Uh, and the noise variance is coil specific. Not that you, you could have a problem with a coil, maybe one coil is especially noisy relative to some other coil. Maybe some coil is more, is you know, uh, physically more distant from the object that you're trying to image. There's sort of different possibility, different reasons why the noise for a single individual channel might be higher or lower than one of the other channels. Um, so it depends in part on what we call coil loading, and that's sort of how much conductive tissues do you have near the coil. Uh, it can, of course, like I said, depend on the proximity of the coil to the patient. There are ways to measure it. You can do a so-called noise scan. I'll, we'll talk more about noise in a couple of lectures. Uh, but what's really important about this is it allows us to weight each coil's contribution. Right? So if you have a really noisy uh, channel, then the variance will be really, really high. And that will mean the contribution, the sum for that particular image is low. And you don't want to throw in a bunch of really noisy data unnecessarily. Right? And so, if we can measure the noise variance uh, for each individual channel, then we can do a, a basically a weighted reconstruction based on the noise variance. So that you push down the contribution from our poor data. And if we have really good data, then it ends up being more consistent with some of the other information. It's the, it's the only thing worth noting when the, the, the image covered by the base coil will be not as much as the image above. That's, that's so absolutely that's possible. So if you go back to, sorry, the clicker's going really quick. Uh, so I think what you're suggesting is, well, what if this particular channel down here is really noisy? And that means I'm not getting significant, say, image information from this quadrant for my final image reconstruction, right? That's, I mean, that will happen. You'll get some signal contributions from the other three coils for this part of the field of view, so they can, in part, sort of make up for that. But you can have, there, 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 there are several and many different artifacts, but one can be coil shading. So the overall intensity across the field of view might have some weighting associated with it. And that can happen, for example, if you've lost contributions from one coil. But it's better to underweight that coil, meaning to divide by its noise variance when the variance is high, and so then that signal contribution is low. Uh, because otherwise, you're, you're, you're adding a lot of noise from this, you know, the other parts of the field of view, the other three quarters of the field of view, to the rest of your image. And that's going to be useful. Okay, so that's th this is just a sort of touch on how we how we do multi-channel or, or here multiple coil uh, reconstruction, and the idea that of course is once you have this final image, uh, this is done at the pixel level, right? Then you can get that to become a magnitude image. We'll talk about phase reconstruction later. Uh, there are some useful ways to make use of not just the magnitude information but the phase information. Uh, there's sort of several ways to do it, but I, I wanted you to at least see how we can combine the two things. Okay. 
So what most of this lecture is going to be about is assuming that we've combined the data from multiple channels, and now we're just talking about having imaging data for, for the experiment, whatever that experiment actually is. Yes? Why don't we do this motion by combining the big data files and the back data files and then talking about the reconstruction? There's, there, there are actually several ways to do the reconstruction. This is maybe one of the simplest ways, but you, you can do case-based based reconstructions or you can do image-based image space based reconstructions. The linear should be linear transformation between the two spaces, so it's, in principle it's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, when we talk about parallel imaging, a topic we'll hear about later, there are different approaches for dealing with a case space based reconstruction or an image based reconstruction. There's a whole class that can be taught just on linear transformation. So today what we're going to talk about is a little, a little bit more about how we actually mathematically go from the, the K points that we sampled. We think now we understand how to move around K space and collect all the K, K points that we need. How does that get us actually back to having an image? And so we know a fair bit now about all the individual measured signals that we're going to get, right? All these K points, if you will. Uh, we have some underlying image here. I'm calling the image function, but this is the this is the object. Well, this is the image of the underlying object, um, and we should have some spatial information encoding scheme. In our case, we're de largely dealing with the Fourier transform, uh, and this uh, what this uh, expression is indicating here is that the signals that we're measuring are actually the Fourier transform of this underlying image function, the, the image uh, the, the image transverse magnetization. If you what we're actually interested in is to recover the image uh, from the measured signals, right? So we think we know the mechanics, we know the, how to do the phase sensitive detection, the quadrature detection, and all these kinds of things so that we can get a bunch of S of Ks. The question is how do you invert this? Because what we actually want is the image at the end, right? So how, do we, how can we conceptually do that or even mathematically do that? Uh, so this was our MR signal equation, right? We just said that the signals that we're receiving, I can write this as a time-based signal, or I can space based signal, we've seen this in a few different forms. But it's related to the integral, right? We're getting signal from the entire object. Here I'm just integrating over x and y because that's my excited slice. I don't care about z anymore because I've just excited a slice that I think of as being in z dimension. So it depends on the integral, the state of the transverse magnetization, right? This is all your spin echo, gradient echo, inversion recovery, saturation recovery business. And then we're doing a number of different experiments with different spatial frequency patterns. We can modulate the spatial frequency pattern to give us different S of T's or S of K's because we know the connection between K space and gradients uh, and quite some time. Uh, so we recognize that this is in fact related to the 2D Fourier transform of the transverse uh, magnetization, which is a really uh, sort of ingenious sort of way of doing the encoding. There are other ways, but this K space formalism and, and using frequency and phase encoding lends itself to seeing this as a 2D Fourier transform. Uh, we know what our different delta omegas are. Our different delta omegas just depend on what's the applied gradient strength and how far away are we from the axis center. We could do that along, let's say, the x, the y, or uh, even the z direction if we wanted to. But here I'm choosing just x and y to think of uh, you know, for encoding the in plane dimensions, right? the, the slice thickness of those in the z direction. Uh, and then we know the connection between k space and gradients uh, when we're just worried about constant amplitude gradients for finite periods of time. Uh, so we can start making some of these substitutions. What we end up with in the end is, uh, and we've seen this again, this goes back to the end of the last, uh, or almost the end of the last lecture, is that all the signals that we measure, all the KXs, all the KYs, all those points in K space, are just related to the Fourier transform of the underlying transverse magnetization. And this transverse magnetization here really is the image, right? This is what we're trying to recover at the end of the day. We can encode different contrasts, we can different uh, mean, uh, contrast mechanisms, but ultimately that's our image. So if you go back and look at the ladder a little bit, he, he, he flip-flops a little bit between calling this the transverse magnetization, calling it the image, the image itself, and sometimes calling it I hat. Uh, and there's a subtle distinction there that I'll, that I'll touch on a little bit later, but conceptually it's, it's the, uh, the state of the object that we're trying to sample. Okay, so Okay, 
So uh, this is another way of writing the MR signal equation. And what we see in this example here is that we, the principle could be integrating. We don't know what the bounds of the integration are necessarily. Right? In its simplest sense, it's the Fourier transform of integrating from minus infinity to plus infinity. We have described this relationship as being a Fourier transform relationship. So S of k and the image uh, as a function of space are related to one another through the Fourier transform. We could, in fact, write these out as uh, three different integral equations depending on uh, whether you're doing a one-dimensional imaging experiment, a two-dimensional imaging experiment, or in fact, the three-dimensional imaging experiment. So for the last experiment there, we would do the frequency encoding in one direction, and then we would do, say, uh, phase encoding in the y direction and phase encoding in the z direction. So conceptually, you can encode, say, the full three-dimensional imaging um, But again, the problem was we know how to get these S of K points. We can imagine how to fill in our K matrix. What we actually want to understand better is how this is related to actually determining the, uh, the image uh, itself. And we know it's through the Fourier transform, but formally, how do we actually uh, get to having that understanding? So the first thing we can do is the K points that we're going to sample, right? We're going to sample N K points, right? There's so many points in our array. Our array has a finite number of So the first thing we do is to say, well, let's just talk about uniform sampling of k-space, where kn is just n times delta k. So delta k is some step size that was related to something. You remember what delta k was related to? We'll come back to it. What's that? Field of view. So not an obvious relationship, but 1 over delta k is equal to your field of view. And we'll see that a little bit today, and, and, and we'll, we'll get into that. So I might come up. So the point is, we can just make a simple substitution. We want to sample. We are going to sample all these kn's. That's just the same as n times delta k, because we keep delta k as a constant. And our n's are just, what are the different, say, points in k-space that we're trying to acquire? In the middle of k-space, 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, up to a total number of n points. And if we have a total number of n points in k-space, then we have a total number of n points in our image space, which is 1 to 1 correspondence, right? So we're just going to make a simple substitution that says, uh, we can, uh, we know we're doing discrete sampling, and it's uniform discrete sampling, but we make a simple substitution to say, all we really care about in our S matrix, which is really like our k-space array, we just care about the index, which point in that array are we actually talking about. And by substitution, we just say it's, it's e to the i minus 2 pi n delta k. And this is the one-dimensional case, n delta k x. That's the position of so what does that do for us? Well. So now we're back to this expression here. This is what we actually measure. We measure our, the, the amplitude to those k points at n, at, at, at n positions separated by delta kx. And that's equal to this integral of our the image that we actually want and uh, the Fourier transform, if you will, of the image that we actually want. So the question is, how do we actually invert this? Because what we really want is an i of x equals expression. Right? That's, that would tell us that our image is equal to something of being sort of encoded this way. So there's there's a lot of work that goes into getting to this. You can go back to the latter bar. I'm not going to work through sort of mathematically all the steps. It's, it's heavy on the math, less heavy on the physics. But the point is, that what you end up seeing is um, that there is a Fourier series. The, the inversion of this expression results in showing that summing over all these uh, spatial frequency patterns, right? So these are the weights, the S of Ns. These are the spatial frequency patterns that we're sampling, right? Is it a high, is it a, um, a low spatial frequency pattern or a high spatial frequency pattern? And summing up over, summing up the appropriate weights of all of those spatial frequency patterns actually does get us to our image. Now, the image here is, looks in a funny form. It has 1 over delta k in front. That's OK. That's just our field of view, and it's really just a constant anyway. And it's equal to i of x, right? Now, it has this funny business on the end here, this minus n over delta kx, because we've summed over minus infinity to infinity on both sides. And so what we actually have here is what we call a periodic extension of i of x. i of x is the image that we really want to recover, but it's replicated ad infinitum because we're summing over minus infinity to plus infinity. So what does the periodic extension look like? I'll show you in just a second. But this expression tells us that we can recover uh, the image i of x itself just by adding up the appropriate weights of all the different Fourier sampling equations. That just basically comes from the discrete Fourier transform. 
So this is just rewriting that same expression and we're, we're showing it again. Remember, this term here is just all these different patterns that we sample, right? We can, we can pick a lot of those different patterns. If we fix delta k, and in general delta k is fixed because our field of view is fixed, then all we're talking about is making sure we get enough ends, end points, to have the resolution that we want, right? More end, higher resolution. Lower end, lower resolution. And we'll touch on resolution and, and field of view a little bit later. So on the left-hand side here, this is just a Fourier series. We're just adding up a bunch of things. Delta K is the fundamental sampling fre frequency. You're actually looking at uh, integer multiples of delta K, N delta K. And S, and, uh, S of N is just the coefficients of that N per month, how many, uh, the, the, the magnitude that you've measured for that N per month. The right-hand side, again, this is just what we call the periodic extension, I of X. And it just means that because we're, our bounds on this are plus minus infinity, meaning we're looking at all of x, uh, you're going to see your object in the middle here, but it's also going to be replicated uh, in the second field view, the third, fourth, fifth field view. This doesn't really matter to us. This happens sort of as a consequence of the sort of the, the purity of the mathematics here. At the end of the day, all we reconstruct and care about is the field of view that's in the middle. Uh, what it will relate to a little bit later is that if you don't have uh, the appropriate delta k, and your field of view is too small. Then we saw it before. If the field of view is too small, what happens to your? What do you see in your image? Alias image, right? And so you can sort of picture if the field of view is too small, that it's these periodic extensions that are actually what's mathematically what's sort of folding in, right? And that would happen as a consequence of delta k being uh, too big. So our S of K is measured for K on, on all of D, right? And in principle, D could be big, right? It could go from minus infinity to plus infinity. That would be the purest representation of our underlying image I, right? But we don't have the time to do that, right? So we can, I of X can be recovered, right? So it's, it's not maybe entirely obvious. We can recover the I of X that we really want from its periodic extension. Uh, under particular circumstances. So the first thing is, if I of x is 0 for x greater than the field of view of I of x0, that just means that the field of view that you've chosen encompasses the object, right? And outside of your field of view is nothing. That's the first statement. Uh, so if that's actually true, then then we can actually write an explicit expression for i of x, right? So i of x equals, and that's what we really wanted to do. That's what this whole sort of exercise was about, sort of walking you through, right? How can we get to the point where we say, the image that I want to recover, how is it related to the data that I actually measure, right? And you'll see now that it's related to, again, those weights times the appropriate weight multiplied by this, the appropriate spatial frequency sampling pattern, right? We can extend this to 2D all the same, we just have a different exponential term. Uh, we have an additional exponential term. So mathematically, you know, we skipped a bunch of steps, but this is the final and, and sort of important result to know, right? So we can recover the image from the things that we measure. We measure the S of X. Okay. But the limits on that expression were infinity. That takes a long time, right? So we're not actually going to do that experiment. We're not going to have N delta K where N is plus minus infinity. Right? We're, we're going to have a much more discrete or shorter number of sampling uh, points that we'll require. And so what we can define is what we call the Fourier step size, which was just n delta k. Um, and we can define the total number of sample points. So how many points do you want to measure? Usually what we dictate in our imaging experiments is the field of view. We want the field of view to encompass the object. And the next thing you, you, uh, you sort of control about your experiments is how many points do you want to sample? Because the field of view divided by the number of points tells you about what? If my field of view is 100 millimeters, right, and I have 100 points, then I have 1 millimeter resolution, right? So usually we pick the field of view, we pick the number of points, and then the resolution is calculated for us right there on the screen. You'll see this uh, in, in class, for example. So point being, uh, we're always going to do some finite sampling. Mathematically, we can look at the sort of limits of this, but we really just care about finite. Um, and so this ends up being the most sort of fundamental uh, MR image reconstruction equation for uh, this class, right? 
And again, it just doesn't say anything especially, you know, uh, uh, maybe new after the last six or seven slides. But it just says that the image itself can be recovered by adding up all of the amplitudes for each of the spatial frequency sampling patterns that we use here. And we just subtract them. So it suggests that we can recover the image from the measurement. So let's think about spatial resolution. So uh, resolution, obviously, we care about it, right? In general, we want really, really high resolution, but there's a trade-off, right? So what's the trade-off in MR? Why don't we get high resolution? Because uh, it, can't, it definitely affects your signal-to-noise. So you can think of your voxel volumes as getting tiny. That's bad for our signal-to-noise in general. Uh, and then Time. what's the other reason? Time. Right? So we, have to, we want to scan you know, sort of as quickly as we can. But I think it's worth thinking about sort of what's the, what's the human visual system sort of capable of to begin with, right? So we can, uh, most of us unaided, see about four or five cycles per millimeter, right? So if you try to, you know, look at your retina display, right? We all have retina laptops and retina phones and 4K displays or whatever, right? So there they've decided that if they make the pixel size small enough that it, it exceeds the resolving capability of the human eye. Right? That was sort of the technology which is really kind of interesting, right? Because it means that that technology, at least in that regard, doesn't really need to do much more, right? We're not, we're not as, as, as individual visual observers, we're not gonna benefit from 40K screens, right? Like, we're done. Uh, there's other things that can be improved, but it's not really coming to resolution. Uh, if you extend this out to sort of how many pixels, so to speak, we can see in our own visual fields, right? So everyone's getting excited about 4K displays, and it used to be 1080p. Well, we still have a ways to go in that regard if we want to fill your entire field of view because you need to get up to about 10 million or even 100 million sort of pixel representations to fully occupy uh, your visual field, visual field at maximum resolution. So something to think about. We don't do imaging nearly as reasonably as we usually do. So. Okay, so what does spatial resolution really mean? Well, the spatial resolution of an imaging system is the smallest separation delta x of two point sources uh, necessary for them to remain resolvable in the resulting image. And so we can look on our display here. So uh, in the very, like towards the back, can you guys separate that there are two pixels there? Uh, yeah, what about here? Still yes? Okay, that's your last chance is there, right? <laughs> you get some yeses and some noes, right? So we have different resolving abilities with our, if I took my glasses off, I couldn't read any of what's in here, right? So we have different resolving abilities depending on how sort of corrected our vision is, right? Uh, the point is that there's some object that we care about, usually I of X, or we usually call it I of X. And then the system through which you're observing that object has an inherent what we call point spread function. It doesn't usually perfectly resolve the underlying object. There's some blurring associated with the imaging system Right? This is a general sort of statement. The <coughs> form of that point spread function is very different for different imaging systems. So we'll talk specifically today about what the point spread function is for FOIA imaging, which is what we mostly do in MR. Uh, and we're, uh, not in this lecture, but in another lecture, we'll talk about uh, some consequences of that. Uh, the bottom line is what we actually recover in the end is some image. So, uh, and the library book mixes this up a little bit, so you have to read it a little bit carefully. Uh, but the image i hat is equal to the object itself convolved with the point spread function of the imaging system, right? Whatever that system does to the underlying object. So uh, we didn't talk a lot about convolution in this class, but just as a reminder, uh, this is the convolution of two functions on top, two box functions, right? And we're integrating or adding up the area where they overlap uh, as they overlap. And so the convolution of those two box functions gives you this, this uh, triangular so one interpretation of this would be that you're getting some broadening. If the underlying object is the blue curve here, then when it's convolved with whatever that sampling function is, the red function, the convolution is this triangular function and it's sort of broadening out a little bit the underlying uh, object itself. Uh, another example is just another convolution example. We take that same imaging function, which is the box-like function, and it's going to map out this uh, black curve here. And again, it's kind of blurring out or sort of spreading out the underlying object itself, which is the blue curve. So we have some expectation that uh, that our imaging system will blur the underlying object in some way, right? What it depends on is the shape of that, uh, of the, what we're convolving with. 
right? F of, in this case, F of tau is the object, and we have G of T minus tau being the image in the system. What's the mathematical representation for the most perfect image in the system? If you go back to um, this, what would this be for the perfect image in the system? Just a delta function, right? So the convolution of the object with the delta function would just return the object itself. Needless to say, none of our imaging systems perform like that. Okay, so uh, you know, depending on your familiarity with convolution, we can have two on the image domain on this side here. We can have two objects, so two uh, say points of interest or signal intensities of interest, and if they're separated by two w, then we can evolve them to some imaging system that has a width of w, and we'll still be able to resolve uh, separably those two underlying objects. They'll be blurred out, but they'll still be separable. Uh, as they approach being adjacent and separated only by omega, uh, sorry, w, and you can evolve them to something whose width is w, then they, that's exactly when they begin to touch. Right? Those two objects, you can't distinguish them any longer. Right? We've, we've lost the resolving capability for objects separated by w when the width of the, of the, um, uh, when the imaging system is w, or when we have the width of the points of interest. And then in the worst, you know, a worst case scenario, those objects are even closer together than when they're convolved with that same point spread function for that imaging system. Now they begin to sort of overlap and really blur, and we've lost resolving capability for them. Um, so we said this just a second ago, but we can get a perfect image of our underlying object if and only if uh, the point spread function for the imaging system is the is our black color function. Different ways that we can characterize that point spread function. Right? So the point spread function itself could, in principle, be an arbitrary looking function. Uh, for most imaging systems, they tend to look kind of Gaussian-ish like. They tend to be sort of symmetric looking functions. Uh, not exactly Gaussian, but maybe something sort of. Uh, the resolution limit of any imaging system is, is characterized by the width of the point spread function. But since the point spread functions uh, have kind of, say, Bell-like shapes or Gaussian-like shapes or something like that, what we typically will measure is WH, which is the full width at half the X. So we know what the maximum of our point spread function is. So I'll show you how we sort of get to that for a specific imaging system. And if we want to characterize uh, sort of what its resolving capability is, then we would measure WH, and that's just the full width, the width of the point spread function at its max, uh, at half its maximum. So that's its maximum. There's another way, just uh, for point of reference. We'll mostly think of it in terms of the full width half max. There are other ways of doing it. Another possible definition for characterizing the point spread function is to say that the width of the point spread function is approximate, can be approximated by a box-like function with the same height and area as, as the h of x itself. Uh, just um, talking about the, the full width of the half max, you could approximate it with some other box function. Uh, again, just pointing out that there are so, okay, fine. What we want to get at trying to understand is what is the point spread function for MR imaging, right? So we've, we've, des we've described this sort of Fourier sampling scheme. What does that say about our resolving capabilities of the imaging system itself? So the question is, how do we determine the point spread function H of X, uh, which we remember is this guy here? Um, and one way mathematically to do it, we just, had an ex we just had an expression four or five slides ago that said our I of X equals something, right? So it's related to sum of these Fourier coefficients. So that's our starting point. Uh, the first thing is to say, well, let's just let I of X be a delta function. And then in this convolution here, we just have that I hat of X is equal to H of X, because this is just a delta function. So my I hat of X tells me about my underlying um, uh, point spread function. So we go back to the expression that we had here four slides ago, and we say, okay, well, I know what my I hat of X is. I can recover that from the, all of the things that I measure. If I let my uh, uh, I let my I of X be a delta function, then I can pull back out uh, just the uh, point spread function itself as being a sum over all of these uh, spatial frequency sampling uh, patterns. So this actually is the point spread function for Fourier sampling. That's not entirely sort of easy to maybe conceptualize or look at or understand. So in the lateral book, he makes he takes a couple steps to simplify this into a more geometric uh, example. And it ends up looking like what we call a directed function. A 
bottom line is the point spread function for Fourier reconstruction is approximately something like delta k times the sine function over a sine function. Uh, and we'll, what I want to do is evaluate what that actually looks like. Um, and what you notice if you, if you look at, so let, let's think about it for a second. So the, the point spread function that we have, what kinds of things does it depend on? Well, it depends on the number of points that you're measuring. Makes sense, right? If I measure a lot of data points, I should have a narrow measure very many data points. I shouldn't have very much resolving power, and I should have a wide point spread function. If my, uh, it also depends on delta k, right? So if my delta k is really big, uh, meaning I have a, um, if my delta k is big, what does that say about my field of view? small. So if I have a small field of view, I should have something with high resolution. So we expect as n is going up and as delta k is going up, that this point spread function should get sort of narrower and narrower. And so all I've done on the bottom here is just plot out some examples, right? And so if we choose, for example, the delta k, I mean, it has units, right? But we just, let's just say we choose a delta k of 1. And I'm going to show you some comparisons of different point spread functions slightly different circumstances. So here we're going to, uh, the imaging experiment we're going to do is we're going to measure 16 K points. We're just thinking about the one dimensional experiment here. And if I plot out this point spread function specifically for N equals 16 and delta K equals 1, I'll get a point spread function that looks something like this. Okay? I could measure its full width half max and I would measure something up here and I would be able to put a number on there. Right? So we just take this as sort of the reference standard for comparing some other possible values. So let's look at one. So in this case here, uh, in this case here, I've kept a number of sample points constant, so I'm still measuring 16 K points, right? But I've chosen my delta K to uh, change by a factor of two. So if delta K goes up by two, what happens to my field of view? Delta K goes up, field of view goes down, right? So if I have a smaller field of view with the same number of points, what happens to my resolution? It goes up, right? I have the same number of points, but now I'm saying I'm going to use those points to describe information with an even smaller field of view. And what you see is that the point spread function here, again, just plotting this function, the point spread function here is narrower, right? It's full width half max is narrower than it was for the point spread function that we have. Sense. So just by changing our field of view, we can observe that the point spread function itself changes as well. So let's, we can look at another example. So we can go the um, we can go another direction, right? We can say, well, let's keep delta k the same. If delta k is the same, my field of view is the same. And in this case, instead of measuring 16 uh, data points, I'm measuring 64 data points, right? So same field of view, but more points, right? Four times as many points. And you can see that my full width half max of my point spread function is going down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, no, no you're, you're right. So let, let me try to clarify. So actually all I'm really showing you right now is sort of just what is the point spread function, if, you know, if this is the point spread function. There's not really a lot of MR in here, right? There's number of points and there's something about the field of view, right? Um, and you're right, mathematically, there's not, a, there's not a direct connection to say MR. The connection in part comes through we're, we're under the assumption right now that the MR experiment we're talking about is a Fourier imaging experiment. Right? There are different ways, in principle, that we, could, that we could sample the magnetization, but in this class, we talk about Fourier sampling in, in particular. And so that's, that's, how we ended up, uh, that's how we ended up accepting that this, was, that this was an acceptable way of reconstructing the image itself. Because the, the MRI experiment we do accords with sampling all these different k points in each of these different spatial cubic scenarios. That could be true of some other imaging system, meaning you could think about doing that with an optical system, maybe, or, or you know, a photon counting system or something. 
So there, there's not an immediate sort of physical requirement that this can only happen. Yes? Uh, okay, so let's, let's look at uh, another example. I'm not sure why this one, oh no, we did this one, we did that one, so then the bottom one down here, right? So, What happened in the bottom right one, right? <laughs> so the bottom right one got really narrow, right? The point spread function itself got really narrow. What are the, what are the two ways that I can make my full width half max narrower and narrower and narrower? I can increase number of points or, or decrease delta points, right? Make my field of view smaller and smaller and smaller. And again, those are the two things we generally control in this game, the field of view and number of points. Okay, so come back to our uh, to our uh, Fourier reconstruction, um, uh, we can estimate the full width half max of the, of the point spread function in different ways. This is one way of, of estimating it. And uh, uh, that simplifies to what we call the Fourier pixel size. In some sense, none of this should be really surprising. Uh, what it says is that for Fourier reconstruction, Fourier acquisition and Fourier reconstruction, the full width half max is just one over n delta k. This is what we call the Fourier pixel size. It basically just means if you measure those Fourier coefficients, and you measure n of those Fourier coefficients, uh, and they're separated out by delta k, then you will be able to resolve your object to the resolution that you want it to. Right? It just means that the imaging system should ideally perform just like, uh, just like it would ideally in a mathematical sense. So there's not a, there's not a surprising result here. And this should, in fact, be a, a relatively intuitive result, right? Uh, delta k is just 1 over field of view. So this is field of view on top divided by n. And that just says how wide or what's the width or, or, or length of, of the pixel edge, right? How wide or bigger my pixel is. And it's just field of view divided by n. So field of view is 256 millimeters, and I have 128 n points, and I have 2 millimeter resolution. So it just says that the perfect uh, reconstruction uh, of the sample data gives you back the resolution you would expect. Not a complicated way to get there, but that's the point. Now, the more interesting thing is what happens when our systems aren't quite perfect. And what can, how can the point spread function itself be broadened, for example? And what are the implications, uh, we'll talk about this too, what are the implications for having, say, this ringing outside of our point spread function? Right? So ideally, remember, the thing would just be a delta function. If it can't be a delta function, then probably the next best thing is a box function. And then as you get further and further from being a delta function or a box function, then these kinds of point spread functions are not quite as, not quite as good, right? It means that you're get, you're, something is happening as a function of space outside of the sort of resolving, uh, uh, resolving ability of the system itself. Uh, what does that mean? It means that when you're looking, uh, if this is your point spread function, right? But it means when you're looking at a pixel, there's imaging information coming from outside of that pixel, basically coming into the pixel that you're actually observing. Right? If it was a perfect delta function, then it would just perfectly represent the image in that pixel. But as it becomes a function that's much wider than the pixel itself, then you're folding in information from adjacent regions into the intensity of the pixel that you're observing. So there's some consequence of that, some artifact. And I'll show you what some of those look like and then I'll explain how you can detect them. So bottom line, it's a, it's a bit of work to get there, but this result shouldn't, you should have almost expected this result to be given, that the resolution of our imaging system is just the field of view divided by the number of points we see. Yeah, so far there's been no sort of no consideration for noise. So no. Um, I don't. Yeah, so noise doesn't change the point spread function. Yeah, 
don't know if it'll actually drive that result, but noise will affect the points of recognition. Because noise affects all spatial frequencies um, in some random type of way. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so so uh, we talked about what's the full width half max or what's the what's the width of the point spread function, how it's related to imaging parameters that we uh, care about. Ideally, you would, you would like to reduce the width, right? That means you have a sharper and sharper sort of imaging system. Uh, but you can't reduce the width and reduce M simultaneously, right? Uh, it just means you have to sample the right number of points. You can't look at anything for free. Uh, so an increase in spatial resolution. If we're increasing resolution, that means we're decreasing the width. That requires that we either increase the number of, of points or we uh, increase delta K because increasing delta K decreases the period. Sort of in the opposite sense, if you want to decrease your spatial resolution, uh, which means your full width half max is broader, then that means you have to decrease the number of points you're going to sample, or decrease delta k, and that'll increase your field of view. So the field of view gets big, but you have these big coarse samples. Uh, so here's different examples of what it means from a, say, a case-based perspective, right? So delta k for these two objects is the same. How can I, when I look at these two images, rather, uh, how can I assert that the delta k is the same between these two? Why would I say that? Because the field of view is the same, right? So if the field of view is the same, uh, but the difference is the number of k points that I acquire, not, many, not very many k points versus a lot of k points, then these are the differences in my k data if we keep everything sort of scaled, right? I've blown up the image on the right here uh, so that you can see the image individual sort of pixels, but the K data on the left-hand side would just be the middle of K space. If I only acquire the sort of middle block of K space of you know, not, not very many endpoints, then I end up with a coarse image. But if my delta K is kept the same, uh, then I can go farther and farther out into K space and I can get a more and more finely resolved image. Again, there's penalties and reasons why you can't always get all of that data, but uh, <coughs> you obviously can resolve a nicer image. Skipping around a little. So anyway, so the, <clears throat> the next, thing to, next thing to talk about is the field of view itself, right? Mm -hmm. So for any signal, right, we talk about space signals in this class all the time. We talk about time signals as well, but space signals are just signals that vary over space. Images are space signals, right? So a space signal, g of x, we refer to it as being space limited if g of x is zero outside of the field of view, right? It's space limited. It has no no interesting information content outside of the field of view, then that's a space limited signal. Sort of uh, in relation to that, you can talk about a space signal being band limited if its frequency spectrum is zero outside of some K max. What does K max tell us about? What does it tell us about our image space? Resolution, right? And so uh, it's possible that for a particular object, you could be band limited. If, you're, if you were trying to image something that had very coarse objects in it, you wouldn't benefit from increasing levels of resolution. Now, that's not really true of imaging you know, biologic specimens, right? People, for example. We don't know the limits of spatial resolution in it uh, until we get down to you know, sub-protein you know, level things or something. Bottom line, it's possible to have a signal that's space-limited or band-limited. Uh, if your signal is space-limited to within the field of view and band-limited to within K max, uh, then, then we can identify that the, that the pixel size, the delta x, is just 1 over n delta k, right? field of view divided by n. And so our k max itself uh, and, and our k max is just n times delta k. So how far out into k space did we go? We took delta k steps and we took maybe n of those steps. So now we can relate the field of view uh, to we know, rather, that the field of view is just n times delta x. That's our pixel size and how many of them do we have. So that tells us about our field of view. And then we've seen before that that's related, of course, to just 1 over delta k. So there's sort of a spatial frequency connection to the field of view. And there's also just a sort of almost more geometric interpretation of it, just being the number of points times the delta x that we have sampled. So, yes. so the field of view. So we have this object that we're trying to reconstruct from this, uh, from this Fourier uh, series. The object itself is going to repeat because that Fourier summation series repeats, right? We 
is that it's it's a it's a, it's a, a replicating series. So we know the signal is space limited uh, if we sampled it correctly. And so consequently, when we reconstruct the object, we only pull out the, the, the space limited signal that we care about. Like mathematically, this thing is extended beyond the field of view that we care about, but we know better than that, so we only reconstruct. Uh, we'll talk about these things, uh, not, not, we'll talk about it for a second in this lecture, and we'll come back to sort of where they come from uh, in, a, in a different lecture. But the bottom line is that the field of view that we pick for imaging, uh, we know now is related to delta k x along the x direction and delta k y along the y direction. And that means you can change your field of view arbitrarily along the x or y directions, right? We can in MR choose, uh, they don't have to be square fields of view, they could be rectangular left and right, or it could be rectangular down, it just depends on the delta K, uh, or rather when you're at the scanner, the actual field of view that you choose. Uh, we'll relate this a little bit later, I just want to show it to you now, uh, but we'll relate the delta K to, of course, gamma times the gradient amplitude, or what we call delta T. Delta T is basically how long you sample your data points for. It's related, you'll see it later, but it's related to what we call the bandwidth. Um, but so this is along what we typically think of as the frequency encoding uh, we also have delta k y along the delta k y along the phase encoding direction, and it's gamma delta g y. Uh, so delta g y is the phase encoded gradient step size, right? We're stepping that phase encoding gradient discreetly, uh, and then it's also the time of the phase encoding gradient. So how long is that gradient uh, on? Uh, there's some, you know, algebraically we can invert some of these relationships to talk about what is the delta t that we need uh, for a specific field of view or what's the delta gy that we need for a specific field of view. Um, you know, I perhaps didn't have to get into this so much today. We'll come back to actually uh, talking about how we actually pick, say, the gradient strength or the phase encode duration so that we're actually getting the k points that we need to be sampling. Uh, let's see where we are. Okay. Yeah, why don't we take uh, like a few minute break and then we'll come back and talk about there's like maybe three more topics related to reconstructing data from the field of series. So a few minutes. So the first, the first sentence is 
That, that's just like using equations on like these are the like these equations. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So all we do in principle is we're appending zeros to the case space data before we do the Fourier transform. Uh, in general, you're going to append those symmetrically about case space. So imagine having a rectangular sampling of case space, and you want to give zeros on either side, so you ultimately end up with a square array. I'll show you why. Well, a couple reasons why. One, if your sampling matrix is 2VN, then the rate uh, 2 fast Fourier transform can be used. And this is the fastest computer implementation of the Fourier transform. It's one of the fastest in the United States. Uh, but we do a lot of Fourier transform in MR, uh, and so it's nice if the array size is 2VN. Right? That just means you can do this mathematically the computation that doesn't matter. Uh, you can zero pad to increase what I'll call digital resolution. Right? I can zero pad such that my K matrix is huge, and my subsequent image will also be similarly huge, and it will appear like I have more pixels in my image, but that's just digital resolution. There's no more information there. And that's where this technique gets abused, I think, sometimes in the literature, and sometimes in, well, sometimes in the literature, sometimes in politics. It's like people zero pad their data so that it looks nice, but it's not really representative of what they actually have. So I'm really picky about basically not it really serves a scientific purpose. Uh, and the biggest thing, uh, well, not the biggest thing, but the third thing is the reconstruction uh, with the correct mass recognition. And I'll show you what that looks like. So let's imagine that we acquire uh, a K matrix that's 64 by 64, Fourier transform, and I get an image that's 64 by 64. Right, that seems reasonable. Uh, if I zoom this image up, right, I can see that it's kind of blocky, right? It's pixelated. I only had 64 samples, so I get this kind of coarse uh, image of my underlying What's the other possibility? Well, one possibility would be asymmetric resolution. Uh, if I asymmetrically cover K space, maybe I don't get the top of K space here, and I don't get the bottom of K space either. I just get the middle 32 uh, rows of K space. And so this is the acquired K space. If I just do a direct Fourier transform of that data, then I should end up with a rectangular array. Right? It's rectangular in K space, it's gonna be rectangular in image space. But that no longer is the right aspect ratio for object itself, right? And that's because my delta k's were different in the x direction or the y direction. So my field of view is different in the y direction or the x direction. But that's not accurately representing the underlying object. One way to get back to representing it is just to simply stretch it, right? So you could just on your computer stretch it. Another way is to append zeros, do so-called zero padding. So I'm adding zeros above and below here. And then when I take the 2D Fourier transform, I still recover the right aspect I still get back to uh, something closer to the object itself. It's a little hard to see, uh, but what it means is the pixels in, in this image here will be rectangular pixels, right? Uh, sorry. If you stretch it, you'll end up with true rectangular pixels. But our displays, right, any display that you use has square pixels. So when we zero pad things, we're, we're reconstructing back to the right aspect ratio, but you still have square pixels. This is a function of the displays that we use and, in fact, the data that we acquire. So it's not a bad thing. We do this. It happens frequently in our model because we use rectangular fields of view. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. And we'll talk about some artifacts that you can see. That's not a great image to begin with, and we'll talk about what those artifacts are in a second. Uh, and it's related to what we call Gibbs ringing. So uh, if we don't fully sample the data well, we'll end up with this so-called Gibbs ringing artifact. Um, it's associated with spurious ringing around sharp edges. And a sharp edge for us means high contrast, right? We have something really, really dark, like the background is oftentimes very, very dark in MR, adjacent to some tissue. And in human subjects, the outer aspects of our body are typically subcutaneous fat, so we have really, really dark against bright. Uh, T1, uh, short T1s, fat, tend to be very bright. Uh, the maximum overshoot you can actually get is about 9%, but that means you can have a 10% intensity fluctuation across your image just because of this Gibbs artifact, this sampling artifact. Uh, it's independent of the number of reconstruction points, and the, uh, the frequency of the ringing increases as the number of recon points increases. And so what's nice about it is if I can, if I increase the number of frequency encoding points, uh, then, the, then the ringing becomes less and less apparent. And so that's one of the strategies for sort of dealing with this, is just higher resolution imaging, but there's another strategy as well. Where it actually arises from is as a result of truncating that Fourier series model, uh, because we only do finite sampling, and your sampling is really finite, so lower resolution, and 
this gets rid of the fact that there's zero in the bottom here. The easy way to get rid of it is just to acquire more data, but that's not always practical. So let's take a few minutes. So this is just the Shep Logan phantom. You can generate this easily in MATLAB and then the FOIA transform uh, on the right hand side. And we can go to different sampling patterns, right? So we can say, well, what happens if I just get a low resolution uh, sampling of that object? Or what if I get a really high resolution sampling of that object? And then everything else filling in this array is just along the diagonal is sort of symmetric uh, encoding, right? I have a square uh, K matrix that I'm filling. And all the off diagonal stuff means I'm getting just a strip of K space from left to right, or I'm getting a strip of K space up. What I'm going to show you in the next slide is just what happens when I do the 2D Fourier transform of that data, right? My, the, the underlying K data itself is asymmetric in lots of circumstances, and so I don't actually recover the true sort of aspect ratio or dimensions of the object itself, right? It's just a mathematical transformation. It doesn't look all that great. Uh, the next step would be to add zero padding, and I can end up here. So now if I have that different ways of sampling K space. I can zero pad everything to be a, 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 say a 256 by 256 array. And these are the resulting images that I'll obtain. So what do we notice? Well, let's look at um, this example here, right? So this example here, I had 64 K points uh, left, right? But I only had 32 K points going up here. And you'll see this really discrete sort of uh, Gibbs ringing artifact, right? But that Gibbs ringing artifact is really sort of only oriented up down, right? That's the low resolution phase encoding direction. Typically it's the phase encoding direction, but it's the low resolution direction. Compare that to its neighbor just up here, right? So this is 64 by 32 sampling, whereas this here is 32 by 64 sampling. And the only difference is the directionality of the Gibbs ringing artifact, right? So in this image here, the Gibbs ringing artifact is sort of going left, right? And that's because that's the lower resolution direction. So Gibbs ringing is really apparent in that lower resolution uh, direction. Uh, and you can see that as the resolution simply gets higher and higher and higher and higher, the appearance of the underlying Gibbs ringing becomes more and more and more apparent. So we just don't detect it, even though the contrast between the background and that, say, surrounding tissue is still uh, the same. So what's the, what's the sort of moral of the story? Well, zero padding is, is good for recovering the underlying aspect ratio. And higher and higher resolutions are good for pushing down the Gibbs ring. It's not the only strategy, but it's, it's a strategy. So what is, what's the other option? Well, another option is to use a so-called windowed reconstruction. So, so far, we've just talked about sampling all of our K points and treating them all equivalently. They just all appear in the sum, and we use them uh, in accordance with the weight, the S of N that we measure for each spatial frequency point. But there's another possibility. So this is the conventional Fourier reconstruction. We can recover the image of the underlying object by adding up all of the spatial frequencies of all of the, of the right amounts, right, the right amplitudes. The other possibility is to insert a weight. And here we insert a weight we call Wn, okay? So for, uh, for our n delta k, for, for our n delta k sampling point, uh, for our s of n delta k, we have a different weighting factor. So depending on where I am in k space, right, Remember, we're incrementing over n in, in steps of delta k. So as I get out to, say, further and further, or more and more distant k points, I can have different underlying weighting factors, possibly. Right? So this is just the definition of a generalized windowed Fourier reconstruction. The question is, how do you choose w of n? Right? w of n is some function that varies across k space. Right? n is the index in the k space. And now we're saying we have a W of n, meaning the weight is different for every point in k space, or potentially different. That's just the general expression for a window, a window Fourier uh, reconstruction. There's different ways to choose your W of n, lots of possibilities. Uh, so remember, this is the, the, the definition for an imaging system, right? The image that we actually recover is the object involved with the point spread function of the underlying imaging system or the sampling strategy that we use with our imaging. We know how to get back to recovering uh, the point spread function itself, but it, may, it basically relied on choosing that our image, our object itself, the underlying object, was just a delta function. But we could observe that the uh, point spread function was, again, a Fourier uh, series, but this time we have to include the weightings to recover. That's the only thing that's new compared to after that. 
So again, the question is, well, what, is what are the possibilities or what are good choices for the underlying weighting function that we can choose? Uh, this is one example. So this is what's called a Hamming filter. Uh, the Hamming filter is defined as this. Uh, we'll show you what the consequence of it is in just a second. Uh, the, the, the numeric details don't matter uh, a whole lot. Uh, the point is that uh, centered at the middle of K space, we have a weighting function that looks a little bit like a bell curve. Right? What does it mean? Well, it means that your middle k points, where your, where your index is zero, you're going to fully weight them. You're going to use everything that you measured in your underlying construction. But as you get out to higher and higher points in k space, as your index n gets higher and higher in a positive sense or uh, in a more negative sense, you're going to underweight that data. Right? Now, that's not an obvious thing to do necessarily, but let's look at what it, what it actually does from a, from a practical perspective. Um, if you, look, if you look at the full width half max for the Hamming window and Fourier reconstruction, you end up, you can reduce it or, or you can work out that the full width half max for the Hamming window reconstruction looks something like this. Uh, in general, you have some, uh, uh, you end up with a full width half max that's greater than the one over n delta k, which is what we had previously. Right? Previously, we said the full width half max was equivalent to one over now, depending on how you choose your weighting function here, that will dictate exactly how, how much broader, uh, whether it gets a lot broader or just, or whether it gets a little bit broader or a lot broader, the actual weighting function itself. So the Hamming window of reconstruction, uh, the consequence of the result is you can suppress some of this ringing, uh, but it also reduces the effective spatial resolution. So it's not obvious yet that it suppresses the ringing. That's something we'll show you sort of qualitatively. But you can see here that it's going to broaden the the full width half max in the case resolution. So, uh, what are we talking about? So, let's imagine that our true object uh, looks something like this. It's just some box function, and we're convolving that with a Fourier uh, recon point spread function. We looked at different examples of this uh, before. Convolving the two that means that, that, that the, the image intensity for uh, at that particular location should look like this, but what we actually uh, reconstruct from our from our Fourier sampling uh, uh, method is something that looks like this. So this is what this this is this is everywhere that signal for this pixel ends up, right? So this signal signal ends up spread out into, for example, adjacent pixels out here, right? But imagine that the pixel adjacent to it also has the same point spread function. So there's a mixing of information from this pixel showing up in this pixel, for example, and that's blurring. Anytime you mix information from adjacent boundaries, territories, that's what's contributing to the blurring. So what would we like to do? Well, we'd like to uh, apply a Hamming weight. We, we can look at the Hamming weighted point spread function. The Hamming weighted point spread function looks like this. What's the upside? What's the downside? The downside we saw a second ago. You can't see it distinctly here, but the full width half max is broader. Okay? So that's, that means our resolution is a little bit lower of the image in the system. But one upside is that the ringing outside of this uh, point spread function is lower, right? And that means that that pixel is not contributing signal to adjacent pixels. It's maybe a little bit broader by a few percent, uh, thankfully, uh, but it doesn't have as much ringing outside of that as well. And so if you can evolve the true object with the Hamming weighted point spread function, you get something that looks like this. A little bit wider, but without that contribution outside of itself. So that's qualitative, you know, it's pretty quantitative at this point, but the qualitative example of why you can reduce Gibbs ringing by applying a Hamming weighted filter to your case based data. That fundamentally changes the point spread function of the system such that you recover uh, less ringing, uh, have less ringing in your uh, reconstructed data. Buddy? Uh, that's just uh, uh, apply the You, you, I'll show you the two-dimensional example in just a second, but you can do it in both. Uh, you, you would, in, in principle, every, every manufacturer has their own favorite filter, but they're all two-dimensional Hamming-like filters. So Siemens does something, whatever it feels like it wants to do, and GE does something else, but they apply some 2D weighted filter function. A little bit of sequence on this. So what does that mean in two dimensions? Well, in two dimensions, you can have a you can have a Hamming weighted 
the uh, function along, say, the x direction, and you can have one along the y direction as well. So I showed you this thing that looked a little bit, it was a cosine function, like a, a part of a cosine period. Uh, if you take what's called the outer product, this is the outer product sitting right here, you can create a two-dimensional version of that, of that function. So this is a plot, a two-dimensional plot of a Hamming weighted filter. So what does it mean? Well, it means everything in the middle is going to be retained. It's really, really high in magnitude. So we're just multiplying whatever that K point data is by one. And as we get out to the corners, we're really pushing down the contribution of that data to our image. And that helps you understand a little bit. If I'm underweighting, right? These are these are low amplitudes for that weighting function. That means those spatial frequencies can't contribute as much to my image. That must mean that I get some bloom. Right? The upshot is that if we push back that ringing, we get rid of that gets ringing on that image, and it's pretty effective. So let's look at an example. This is the case-based data. If I just take a 2D Fourier transform, I get this uh, underlying image here. This is not maybe the best example, but there is some ringing artifact of sort of concentric ringing because I was low uh, encoding matrix in both directions. If I just do dot multiplication, this is my acquired case-based data. This is what I actually acquired. And I take that case-based data and I do dot multiplication with this 2D filter. Dot multiplication just means that this corner's amplitude gets multiplied by that corner's amplitude. The middle of case space gets multiplied by, the, multiplied by the middle of case space. So the dot multiplication of these two just gives me weighted case space, and the 2D Fourier reconstruction gives me back this object too. Now it'd be hard to say just by looking at it that this image itself has lower resolution. It does, in fact, have slightly lower resolution, but I think we'd agree that that's an overall better quality image if for no other reason than sort of ringing artifacts uh, have been pushed out. So that's the sort of principles of an application of using a Hamming filter. There's different filter designs again here, there's different possibilities here, but this is the two-dimensional example for the kind of Yeah? Question is that the Yeah, no, in, princi in principle you can do that, right? Convolution in one domain is multiplication in the other domain. So, I mean, you have, you have there, there are different possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in the Hamming filter, was there two possible kinds of quality of the Hamming filter? Did you go back to size and these dots here? Yeah. Two constants there. So, these constants here and here? This is, this is the specific definition of the Hamming filter. Okay. And the thing that's really weird, and I don't know the history of this, there's also a Hamming filter. There's H-A-M-M-I-N-G, and there's H-A-M-M-I-N-G, right? So go figure. And I think the Hamming filter uses half and half, 0.5 and 0.5. Now, I, have, I don't know the backstory there. I don't know if they were friends or enemies. Like, I don't know anything, right? Uh, but, but just remember, because you'll hear it, and, and you'll say, well, did you use a Hamming filter? No, you <laughs> Any? No, handy. Anyway, uh, but the difference is, is quite subtle. Uh, but in fact, you could change you know, these coefficients for different reasons. What it really comes down to, in some sense, is what does your point spread function look like? And does it deal with the problem that you need to deal with? And if it doesn't broaden your point spread function you know, a lot, you know, it's, it's that, well, that's one criteria. What is the forward function? Do you have any questions here? Uh, yes and no, right? So if you go to, uh, so where it is? Uh, uh, here, okay. So where, so I'll ask you, where's the contrast information in, in case space? What part of case space stores contrast information? The middle, right? So our contrast information is mostly here, somewhere in the middle, right? The amplitude of the Hamming, or the Hamming filter is pretty close to one for the middle K point. Uh, but it's not precisely one. And so, so first order, I would say no, it doesn't do anything to contrast. It actually maintains contrast and does something more to, to ringing and edge artifacts. Uh, but if you chose a sharper handing window such that it fell off more quickly, right, uh, that, would, that could have a stronger effect on the contrast in the same way. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, I don't doubt that it'll change, 
I don't, I don't know. I mean, obviously the histogram of this is not identical to the histogram of this, right? So that if you look at, if you just look at the range of, of remaining pixel intensities, yeah, it's definitely going to change. But I don't think it has a whole lot to do with contrast per se, for the reason I gave before. If I'm multiplying middle case space by something really close to one, there shouldn't be much of a change. But again, as you get to sort of whatever an intermediate spatial frequency is, right, somewhere in the middle, that's a mix of sort of contrast and edge information. And when you get out to the edges, it's mostly edges, but it still plays a role in the whole range. Two questions. Uh, so zero pattern you saw. Right. So, so this was the example I gave you back maybe five slides ago. And here you can see the Gibbs ringing was quite apparent, right? So in this example here, you can see the Gibbs ringing sort of, uh, sort of running in the top uh, bottom direction. And in this image here, you see it especially running in the left edge direction. And the point was that it improved as you increased your spatial resolution, but that's not always a practical thing. So what if we zero path, but also apply a Hamming filter? Uh, so the Hamming window reconstruction and zero path, you end up with something like this. And the, again, the point is that the uh, Gibbs artifact is largely suppressed, right? You don't see this ring artifact as apparent in sort of any of these images. And so now you're left to sort of you know, argue with the physician whether they really need this high resolution image that's in the bottom right here, or whether something that's slightly lower resolution and no Gibbs ringing is an acceptable sort of uh, measurement of the freedom from tabulation. Okay, so that's what I have to say today about image reconstruction. Uh, don't forget about the lab. You can download things, including the safety form, uh, before the lab. Of course, I'll see you in lecture on Thursday, and then we'll have lab that night. Uh, and if you can stick around, I'll hand you back homework to the Good. April here? Sorry. <laughs> Some of you picked them up already, is that correct? Yeah. Okay.